Okay, so Benjo's War Stories meets Benjo's Boxing post-fight review. Okay, Georges Guinemer versus Ernst Udet. All right, late May uh, 1917. So what we have here is a very interesting clash. We have um, uh, Georges Guinemer, okay, who's a very experienced, he, he's the champion, okay, he's got 30, 40 confirmed kills, all right, over the Western Front, <clears throat> very experienced pilot, highly skilled, highly decorated, got the Croix de Guerre and things like this from the French government, um, he's battle-hardened, he's been doing this for over a year, he's shot down many enemies, um, he really is uh, the favourite going into this particular clash. Uh, versus Ernst Udet, who is the prospect, all right, just 21, young lad, but a very skillful, talented, we could say amateur, because before, uh, well, actually after the start of the war, but before he was able to enlist or anything, he had paid privately a lot of money to have flying lessons in his youth. Ernst Udet, I believe, is from Frankfurt, I'm mine. Um, he... Uh, who had been building gliders, uh, quite a skillful um, chap with his hands. Um, his glider experiments didn't go too well, but he paid then privately to, um, uh, to learn to fly. And so he had many flying hours taught by an experienced professional uh, teacher um, that was a friend of the family. And as well, um, he also, uh, around this point, he, he tried to get into the, um, the German flying corps but he was rejected. He was too, he was very small. He basically he did any he, he was doing anything to get into the army, but he was tiny. He's like you know five foot four or something. And they didn't want to enlist him as a soldier or an officer. Um, they didn't for some reason want to take him into German Air Force. I'm not entirely sure why. And so off his own back he goes and gets himself trained to be a pilot. Um, initially he's a pilot of observer aircraft you might scoff at that but as we said before on this channel the point of an observer aircraft is that we can go in there observe the fall of the artillery fire um, we can uh, direct the shells we can uh, look for enemy batteries, enemy machine gun nests um, and those can be counter machine gun, counter battery fired um, basically the observers are the ones that do the killing. Uh, they are responsible for the deaths of the troops on the ground. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I just changed to make sure it's videoing. I've done this once already and it hadn't videoed correctly. But yes, yeah, so it appears to be. Um, yeah, so the, the, obser the um, observers, the pilots and observers, uh, they were the ones that are really responsible for winning the war. It was those observers that enabled, in the end, the British, with a bit of help from the French, to do their all-arms offensive, their combined arms offensive, all-arms battle, uh, in 100 days in 1918, and ultimately defeat the Germans on the field. Although, of course, they claim foul play afterwards, much like modern-day boxers do today. The stab-in-the-back legends and everything. Um, but anyway, so he's an observer pilot. But what happens? Um, he gets into a bit of trouble, actually. He crashes one of his planes, he stalls it, and... Uh, and he gets blamed, he gets stuck in the guardhouse for a week. So he has a few little problems in his early days. But then he goes up with an observer. And um, the observer, it's so early in the war, the observer, they don't have a proper bomb rack. The observer is kind of throwing bombs out the side of the plane. And one of them gets caught in the undercarriage of Odette's plane. But the observer's lobbed out, he's got stuck. He can't land with a bomb in the undercarriage, his plane will blow up. So he begins throwing the plane around the air, doing all these kinds of manoeuvres. And um, he shakes the bomb loose and they're able to land safely. And as soon as they're on the ground, the observer talks to the commanding officer and says, this is a great pilot. <laughs> What's he doing just flying these stable observer aircraft? You know, you can get any old pilot to do this. He is a fighter pilot. And so then he's immediately moved to a fighter squadron. And so he's, he's recognised after that happens. Um, but anyway, on this day, in late May of 1917, Udet's actually out on a raid on his own. Uh, he's going to do some balloon busting, because what you'd have, you'd have these hydrogen-filled balloons that were sent up uh, over the lines, again, to observe the fall of artillery fire so you can direct it more correctly and look for other strong points and or potentially not really reconnaissance, but because they're stable, they're just on a rope. Interestingly, the people that would be on these balloons, they would actually um, be equipped with parachutes. 
uh, because it was so easy for them to be shot down. It was so dangerous being on these things that you'd need to jump out and, you know, let your parachute go. Um, they automatically opened up when you jumped out. Um, and then they would try and reel down the balloon before the enemy aircraft shot it up. Um, and interestingly, when uh, Manfred von Richthofen, the great fighter pilot, when he was on uh, one of his uh, brakes, he did that for fun. He went off one of these over balloons and jumped off with a parachute, um, which doesn't strike me as particularly fun when you realise that maybe one in 20 didn't open. Um, but anyway, Richthofen was obviously a daredevil. And if you haven't mentioned it already, although Ode is a prospect at the moment of this clash, he will end up with um, 62 confirmed kills and survive the war. We'll talk about that a bit later. Whereas uh, Georges Guillemet uh, would die late in 1917 We'll talk about that in a minute, with uh, 54 confirmed kills. They may well have got more, but those confirmed kills. So, the day of this clash. Ernst Oda is there, uh, flying off towards the balloons. Um, <clears throat> he sees something in the distance. Um, at the moment, they are over uh, enemy lines. So they're over the Western Front. Uh, Oda has flown into French-controlled uh, territory. And so he sees in the distance an enemy plane, and they fly towards one another. And by this point, Udet has gained some confidence. He had a bit of a ropey start, we should just say. His very first kill, and I give the dude credit for this, right? You know how sometimes with a boxer, they don't want to... They, they don't really have a natural savagery. They don't want to hurt their opponent. They might want to tickle them a little bit, win on points, but they're not savage, and if they see they're hurt, they'll deliberately back off. And we even eat, you know, some ruthless, horrible people like Kovalev, uh, who killed one of his opponents. If you look at that fight, the moment he knows he's severely injured, I forget the dude's name, was it Semelev? It was, it was a name beginning with S, I, I apologise, I can't remember his name. Kovalev backs off, he no longer lands any more right hands when he knows he severely hurt his opponent. Tragically, his opponent still died, it was, it was an awful thing. So even someone as ruthless as that man he didn't want to kill his opponent. We know that Tyson probably did, but that's another story. Um, Udet has this problem. that um, it, When he goes for his first kill, he sees a French cauldron aeroplane, one with like a bucket in the middle, I guess what I call a cauldron, I don't know, uh, where you have the pilot and the observer, kind of like weird bucket hanging beneath the wings. He gets there, he's lined up, he's right on them, he's going to bring them down. He can't, he can't bring himself to fire. His finger's there on the trigger. He can't press the trigger because he knows that's two people in that plane just like me. And he's only a young lad. He's like 20, 21. He doesn't want to kill them. And, you know, I give him credit for that. The problem was that the French observer who had a machine gun did want to kill Odet when he saw him on his tail. He blasts off with a burst of machine gun fire. Odet gets hit in the face. His goggles are smashed. There's blood all over him. Miraculously, it's not gone through his skull. It's kind of the bullet has deflected a little off his cheekbone. He's able to land, but that cauldron goes on to fight another day and no doubt direct a lot more artillery fire and kill a lot more enemy troops. But after he gets over this, uh, uh, and I guess the experience of being wounded in that way and nearly killed, he realises you can't be tentative anymore, you know. Check your tail when you line up on someone to check you're safe, but don't be hesitant about firing. And so he's learned how to shoot down planes. He's shot down three or four by this day in late May. So he sees it in the distance, uh, this plane. They come toward one another. Um, they don't just clash head on, that's what novices do. No, they circle. Um, and Udet is a great pilot. He thinks I'll easily get on the back of this dude. He sees it's a French spot. He's flying an Albatross D2, I think, at this point. Uh, both of them armed with uh, dual machine guns. Both of them decent planes, probably equally matched. They circle, they bank, and, you know, both of them are start pulling out all the tricks, you know, doing half loops, doing inman turns, um, you know, flying upside down, doing barrel rolls. They're doing everything they can to get on the back of one another, and they can't. But for a moment, Ernst Udet just stops to think, what the hell can I do to, to beat this guy? And in the moment that he flies straight and level while he's pondering what to do, he's raked with machine gun fire by the enemy aircraft. Goes all through his top aeroplane, top, top wing. But it's not fatally crippled. And he swings around, and with a few more acrobatics, he gets on the tail of his enemy, OK? And at this point, he presses the trigger for his dual Spandaus. What happens? 
they make a little clunk and nothing happens. They've frozen or they weren't armed properly in the first place or maybe had some different ammunition for taking out um, balloons and it jammed the thing. And anyone who knows anything about guns, they jam all the time. So he's there pounding them, beating them, trying to get them to work. Um, and his opponent, miraculously, sees that he's in distress, he's unarmed, rather than swinging round on him and taking him out as a sitting duck, he puts his hand out for the cockpit, gives a salute, and according to some reports, even flies alongside his foe, his stricken foe, we could say, or at least his impotent foe with no machine guns, and escorts him back over his own lines, back to German lines, so he gets there safely. And Odette has known during this combat because he's got so close when they're tangling. He'd seen the lettering on the planes, and he'd seen that name, Vieux Charles, old Charles, which is what Guillemet called all of his planes. So he knew he was fighting against the ace, uh, Georges Guillemet, who at this point had many, many kills. And so it was an act of chivalry. Should Guillemet have shot down Odette? Well... He went on to take out, as I said, it, as the war continued, 62 enemy planes. Many of those were uh, observer planes. Uh, so we're talking about at least two crew being killed if those are shot down. Um, you could say he was foolish, but um, it was an act of chivalry, maybe an act of mercy. And, yeah, it's one of the greatest clashes of World War One. one of the most famous. Another one we're going to talk about is McManus Squadron uh, versus Werner Foss, who's probably my favourite pilot but we'll, we'll save that for another day the only problem with this story is it's somewhat it's incredible isn't it and unfortunately in the real meaning of the word incredible it's maybe not possible to be true um we know after the war um he wrote uh Odette wrote a Guinemer didn't ever speak of it not in any of your squadron diaries um never mentioned it he was killed late september uh Odette, uh, wrote about it initially after the war, but he didn't say that he'd seen the Vieux Charles on the aeroplane. He said he'd seen a big black skull. So the account is true, but it may not have been Guillemet at all. It might have been just another really talented French spot pilot um, who was in the same squadron, maybe, and was also very chivalrous. So it might be some unnamed pilot. We, we, we don't know. Um, so that's a little thing. And then it was only later... Uh, in about 1938, when he had a ghostwriter, that suddenly that black skeleton or black skull, whatever it was, on the plane that he saw, was changed into a vieux Charles, identified as Guillemet. So it may have been a bit of propaganda or whatever, you know, later on. So it may have been embellished. It, it's a shame that we don't know, but we will never know. Just to quickly talk about what happened to him after the war or during the war in the case of, um, of uh, Georges Guillemet. Late September, he, he, he's getting somewhat battle-weary by this point. He goes to attack a German Rumpler, uh, which is a rather nicely named plane, a Rumpler. I like it. I like, I like the Rumpler. Unfortunately, what wasn't good is there were a bunch of Fokkers above, and I, I don't use that as a, as a swear word. Uh, it was named after Albert Fokker, the, the designer at uh, the company, the Fokker company in, in um, Holland who were traitorously working, uh, well, not traitorously, I guess they were unoccupied, wouldn't they? But um, traitorously working, I say it were anyway, uh, with the Germans. Um, but yeah, so, uh, yeah, all these Fokkers um, were Dutch-designed Dutch planes um, colluding with the Germans. Um, but a bunch of them were above Guinemer. Um They swooped down on him, and he was shot, apparently, through the head. Somehow, I don't know how this happened, but he managed to make a landing despite that. But when they went down to him, he had a broken leg. I think he was shot in the arm. But there was one bullet wound clearly through the head. He, he was dead. Um, the Germans tried to retrieve his body. Um, he'd fallen sort of, I guess, in no man's land or just on the German side. And they would attempt to retrieve bodies, especially of pilots and so on, especially if they knew it was a famous pilot. Uh, they were unable to do, due to artillery fire. And so I believe um, Georges Guinemer will go down as one of the missing. I, I don't believe we ever located his body, sadly. Um, but that's what happened to him, uh, as happened to so many of these pilots. One little moment of the lapse. Don't spot that there's some enemy above you. Uh, they come, you get that target fixation going for the, the rumpler, and then boom, he's down, shot through the head. Very similar to Rick Toffin in some ways, you know, Rick Toffin wasn't brought down by damage to his plane. He, he had been shot sideways uh, through the body. 
um, uh, and appeared there was no damage other than one 303 round that had gone straight through him, uh, um, enfiladed him basically from uh, Australian ground fire, uh, most likely, in my opinion. Um, what happened, though, to uh, Ernst Udet? This is perhaps more interesting. So after the war, he goes to be a barnstorm and a stunt pilot and a general bon viveur. And then the Nazis come to power, and he's great friends with Goering, because he ends up the war in the flying circus under Goering, has a better score than Goering, but they're, they're mates. And then Goering gets in charge of the Luftwaffe, and he says to um, Ernst Udet, hey, why don't you come and work for me? You can be in charge of maybe uh, the, you know, the technical innovations, the overall kind of like research and development, the R&D branch of the Luftwaffe. We could really use your help, you know, because everyone likes you. Everyone seemed to like him. Uh, yeah, contacts in industry. Um, he's just great for the image of the Luftwaffe. Odette, to his credit, says, well, yes, I, you know, I know people like me, but I have no administrative skills. I'm a pilot. He basically says to Goering, I'm a flyer, I'm a pilot, that's all I know. Goering says, oh, it doesn't matter, you'll just be the figurehead, you can employ somebody for you to do all the, the donkey work, you know, and we'll, we'll, I'll help you out, kind of thing. Of course, Goering doesn't help him out, uh, he takes the role, uh, doesn't perform very well, doesn't keep check on what's happening beneath him. And um, this is one of the reasons why Germany never develops a strategic... Um, bomber, a heavy bomber really for World War II that could have been a godsend to them uh, because they didn't have a real strategist who really kept his hands firmly in control of their technical development um, they had Milch but unfortunately it would seem Goering uh, brought in Odette deliberately to offset the power of Milch a little like Hitler would bring in different people as a rival so neither got too powerful this appears was the case in the Luftwaffe and Milch was far better and he, he was far better at organising and administrating but he didn't have that um, sort of research and development and overall strategic um, goal kind of you know, long term development role that Odette had and Odette wasn't handling his business um, and Goering was no help. Goering was more interested in acquiring morphine and alcohol and expensive paintings he could loot after the war began. Goering was no help. And even when he met up with Odette, apparently they, they just talked about old memories from when they were in the Flying Circus. Um, so, what happened to Ernst Odette? Ultimately, well, obviously, 22nd of June 1941, Barbarossa has launched uh, Germany and its allies attacked with around 4 million men uh, the Russian, uh, well, the USSR, Russian Empire, whatever you want to call it. And things start off well for Luftwaffe, and they basically blow the, um, uh, the USSR, the Soviet Air Force, the Red Air Force, out the sky. But things begin to change after a while because the Luftwaffe wasn't really designed for a long war of attrition. It really was designed for short, sharp, tactical fighting. And soon there's just not the infrastructure. And this, a lot of this... Uh, Odette should have handled. He should have had better training programs in place, better procedures for building fighters. There should have been strategic bombers so that they could go deeper and attack, um, you know, transportation hubs and manufacturing hubs and all this. And suddenly, Goering turns on his old mate and starts blaming him in front of Hitler. This is the reason why things aren't working out. This is why we've suffered defeat in front of Moscow and so on. And it wasn't just being checked at Moscow in December. They were smashed at Moscow, December 1941. Um, and sadly, Udet writes a note apparently on his um, bed uh, board, backboard of his bed with a red pen or pencil, saying, Reichmarschall, you've deserted me. And then he's talking to his girlfriend here on the phone. And while they're still talking, maybe he possibly blames her as well and claims that she's deserted him, that's unclear. He shoots himself in the head, and that's the end of Ernst and Odette. And it's obviously covered up at the time. It's said that he, uh, he suffered a tragic accident whilst test flying a new weapon. But he didn't. He took his life. Um, in the same way that also later on in the war, Yeshinek, another top Luftwaffe officer, also who was suffering blame for various things, in particular the failed airlift at Stalingrad in the winter of 42 through to 43, when it seems Yeshenek was the one who claimed, yeah, we can supply the German 6th Army under Paulus, um, did a few calculations, then said, actually, no, we can't, by which point it was too late, and the airlift, you know, had kind of been set into motion, and Yeshenek 
got the blame, along with Goering. Goering does get a lot of blame for that, when actually it was probably Yeschenek that um, was more to blame in this case. But he also, in very similar circumstances, uh, took his own life for the bullet to the head. So, tragic. But anyway, that was the clash. That's the post-fight review. Were they right to be chivalrous? Should uh, Georges Guinmer have shown that act of chivalry? Uh, what do you think about Udep? Fend to pull the trigger in his first clash. Um, it, yeah. Any thoughts in the comments? If anyone watches this, Ben Joe's War Stories, Gravity Temptations, bye bye.